These two elderly couples really enjoyed spending time together and they were having a delightful evening at uh, one of their houses and the ladies were sitting indoors in the living room and the guys were out on the patio and one fellow said to the other said hey you you and your wife need to try this restaurant that we went to last night it is really good and the other fellow said well what's the name of it and the first guy said you know as I get older I just forget things I cannot remember maybe you can help me what do you what do you call that flower that has red petals on it and thorns on the stem And the fellow said, "Uh, Rose? And the first guy said, yeah, that's it. And he yelled at his wife, hey, Rose, honey, what's the name of that restaurant? (laughs) (laughs) Well, of all the things we shouldn't forget, at the very top of that list is a promise about the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. We're going to look at that promise. Uh, before we do, let me just remind you, or if you're new to Old Kills, welcome. And what we're doing is we're working through some promises, trying to build our lives on promises instead of the pain or problems of life. There's over 7,000 promises in the Bible. No way we can look at them all. But the sampling uh, of those is, we hope, enough to, to create a desire to know more. And each week we make a, a declaration Uh, What we do is we sit up straight, so if you can do that, we have sit up straight monitors who are watching. (laughs) Put our shoulders back, fill your lungs with air, your hearts with hope, wake up anybody around you that's dozed off, and uh, let's say it like we mean it. You ready? We are building our lives, our hope, we do not, or We stand promises of God. Amen. Please forgive our speaker today. His sins are so many. Help us to see Christ, just Christ. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said. Back when my legs were stronger and my ego was a little bit bigger, I let a friend talk me into entering a bike race. Pat McGrath attends our church. He's been in competitive biking since elementary school and he and I used to bike together and he convinced me to be a part of a race in the hill country. Not just any race but a race that includes an ascent, uh, a one mile ascent, really actually it was a four mile ascent up a 12 degree gradient hill. In other words it was a bring yourself up out of the saddle, pump, burn your thighs, run out of oxygen section of the race that for most of us would take about 10 or 15 minutes. It was appropriately called the killer diller. <laughs> so we were a part of the Saturday race. The race began and those bikers who really deserved to be there like Pat took off those of us barrel-bellied laggards were in the back. And for the first few minutes, we were making jokes about the intensity of the race, but soon we stopped making jokes because you have to have oxygen to talk. (laughs) And we were running low, and we hadn't even reached the hill yet. And when we came to the hill, everything inside of me started to die. My legs were burning. I was running out of air. And I was having less than Christian thoughts about my friend, (laughs) Pat McGrath. (laughs) About a third of the way up the hill, though, I felt something in the lower, smaller portion of my back. I felt a hand pushing me. I really did. I felt a hand pushing me up the hill. And, And looked and there was my friend, Pat. He had finished the race. <laughs> remembered me, actually pedaled all the way back up, at least a third, maybe halfway up the hill, dismounted from his bike, placed his bike on the side of the road, ran and caught up with me, which tells you how slowly I was pedaling. <laughs> and he began to run, pushing me up the hill. He said, I told you, you would finish this race, and I'm here to guarantee that you will do so. I'm wondering if you could use a push. 
Doesn't life sometimes feel like an uphill ride? And maybe you're running low, not on oxygen, but hope, or friends, or encouragement, or maybe you are out of breath. If so, I'm so happy you're here because I'm so happy to tell you that you have a friend and that friend has come along beside you, indeed taken up residence within you to give you a push. And that friend is named the Holy Spirit of God. His last words to his disciples before Jesus ascended into heaven included a promise of the Holy Spirit. He told them, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. The final words before Jesus ascended into heaven were somewhat of a transfer of the baton. Jesus was ascending and the Holy Spirit was descending into the hearts of the followers. Jesus did not promise the disciples that everything would be easy. He did not promise the absence from disease. He did not promise the guarantee of a certain level of income or popularity. But he did assure them that the Holy Spirit would give them power. And the Holy Spirit was the powerful force giving the New Testament church the push to make the climb. The Holy Spirit continues on earth what the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, have begun. Though all three expressions of the Godhead are still active, it is in this final age, under the purview of the Holy Spirit, that the church is empowered. And the Holy Spirit lives today granting power and strength and hope to all those who need it. Indeed, he promises to give us a push. Let's use that word push as an acronym. It is a short summary of what the Holy Spirit does. In fact, just a sampling. There's no summary. We don't know all the Holy Spirit does. But just a sampling. If you'd like to fill in the blanks, let's get to work on those. The Holy Spirit promises power to the saint. The Holy Spirit promises power to the saint. Of the many scriptures that help us understand the place and role of the Holy Spirit, we could turn to the Old Testament book of Job. If God were to withdraw his spirit, all life would disappear and mankind would return again to dust. So really the Holy Spirit is the animating force behind creation. Every unfolding flower is a fingerprint of God. But for Christians, even more important, the Holy Spirit is more than the animating force behind creation. The Holy Spirit is the midwife in the process of being born again or the new birth. Jesus told Nicodemus, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of the water and who? The Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. So you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You, can hear, it, you hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So when you say yes to Christ, the Holy Spirit says yes to you and takes up residence within your heart. The Holy Spirit enters and bringing with him, the Holy Spirit brings that animating power, convincing, guiding, strengthening, and assuring you that you're not alone in this journey. He enters us, according to Ephesians 1.3, upon the confession of faith. And as he has his way within us, a wonderful transformation occurs. We become less and less like us, and we become more and more like God. He begins to help us think with the mind of Christ, to speak with the lips or the words of Christ. And even our heart displays the affection of Christ. So this is all the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing about a regular, increasing transformation of the saint. But the Holy Spirit is concerned not just with the individual saint, 
He is also, we're gonna see, concerned with the spirit of the church, the unity of the church. And so we can say that the Holy Spirit promises to bring unity to the church. Unity really matters to God. A, A fractured and divisive church is a terrible testimony to the world that is already fractured and divisive, right? But when a fellowship of believers enjoys a spirit of unity, that's attractive. That appeals to the world, and it, appeal, and, it, and, it, and it bears witness to the unity of God. For that reason, the Holy Spirit takes responsibility for creating unity in the church. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We're never told to create unity. Unity's already there. We just keep it, we acknowledge it, and we follow the work of the Holy Spirit. Harmony is always an option because harmony in the Holy Spirit is always present. And so we can no longer say, uh, I just can't get along with so-and-so. Well, you can't, but the Holy Spirit can. And so we can begin to pray, Lord, help me to get along with so-and-so because the Holy Spirit promises unity in the church. Wherever there is unity in the church, the Holy Spirit receives all the glory. Wherever there is disunity in the church, we go to the Holy Spirit and we ask for help and for comfort. The Holy Spirit unifies the church. But also, the Holy Spirit seals and supervises the church. The Holy Spirit invisibly yet indispensably serves as a rudder to the ship of your soul. He, he, He keeps you in the right direction and he keeps you from tipping over. Here's a wonderful promise. You were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. I wonder if any of you have ever seen a mason jar. Have you? Do those still exist? My grandmother and my mother canned vegetables and jams and jelly. And I can remember in both of their kitchens, whenever they would fill fill the mason jars, they had these uh, lids that they would twist and there was a rubberized seal. Does that sound familiar? Am I misspeaking, ladies? And you, if, if I'm just imagining, it sounded like there was even a kind of a pop, and you knew they were whatever was in that jar was sealed, and then they would store it, uh, and it would it, the contents would be protected. With that in mind, we can understand that the Holy Spirit seals the soul of the believer. You are too valuable to be exposed to the onslaught of the devil. And he may tempt you and he may test you, but he cannot have you. He cannot have you. Sometimes my heart is troubled because so many people think that they're gonna lose their salvation. They think that they're in one day and out the next. Listen, you're not good enough to save yourself. You're not good enough to stay saved. And the same power that saved you initially is the power that preserves you eternally. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. He wraps himself around you with a protective presence that the interlopers from hell cannot breach. He has you in the palm of his hand. Some of you need to receive that promise right now. And this salvation is not contingent upon having the right emotions, really not contingent upon having the right actions. It's contingent upon placing your trust in Jesus Christ. And once that happens, this wonderful, wonderful gift happens. And that is you are sealed. You, the imprimatur of God is placed on you. And when the devil tries to get you, he cannot have you. For that reason, there are many promises in Scripture that, that bring us hope. Here's one, Ephesians 4 and verse 30. Remember, he is the one who has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Oh, bless you, Holy Spirit, that you have sealed us and guaranteed that we will be saved on the day of redemption. Not only does the Holy Spirit seal us, the Holy Spirit supervises the church. The Holy Spirit is in charge of all the details of the church. 
I have a friend who supervises an apartment complex. One day I said, what, is, what does that mean? He says, well, I'm just, just in charge of everything. I keep the place running. Well, maybe we could say the same about the Holy Spirit. He keeps the place running. Uh, here's a list of some of the jobs the Holy Spirit has. Comfort the bereaved. Guide the believer into all truth. Reveal the things that are still to come. Offer prayers of intercession. Bear witness to the saint, that the saint is saved. Attest to the presence of God with signs and miracles. Create a godlike atmosphere of truth and wisdom and freedom. We could add to that the distribution of the gifts of the Spirit. His list of responsibility is wonderful, is varied, but maybe at the top of that list we should include the word holy. Holy, because the Holy Spirit makes us holy. He is about the task of sanctifying the saint, helping us resist temptation, remain pure, elevate our morality, he calls us to a level of holiness. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Now you know my bicycle story had a wonderful ending. I actually did complete the race thanks to Pat's push. And I enjoyed the downhill ride. And I really enjoyed crossing the finish line although I think I was dead last but I ended up with a good t-shirt and a sermon illustration. <laughs> but what if I'd said no to Pat? What if when I felt him pushing me, I slapped his hand away and out of pride said, <laughs> I can do this on my own? Well, many people do that to God. It is pride that keeps people from forgiveness it is pride that keeps people from the power of the Holy Spirit. Pride drives people away from God. Don't be among those. You cannot make it on your own. You cannot. And God knows that. For that reason, he offers to save us, then indwell us, and to change us more and more into his image. Or what if I had have turned to Pat as Pat was trying to push me up the hill and said, you know, Pat, I'm not worthy of your help. I'm not any good. I shouldn't have ever been a part of this race to begin with. Go find somebody who deserves to be pushed. Well, some people do that with God as well. They just say, you know, I'm not worthy. And maybe you believe that because all your life people have told you that. Listen, God thinks that you are special. He thinks that you are something special. And he calls you even the temple of the Holy Spirit. He must really love you because he is willing to indwell you and change you and it's the voice of the devil. In fact, we stand against the devil today and tell him he cannot have you. And so you stand against that thought. God wants to empower you and change you and use you to be salt and light all over the earth. It simply falls to us to cooperate to receive this promise and then cooperate with this promise. Well, how do we do that? Well, I think simply we try to walk in step with the Spirit. That's what the Apostle Paul said. We walk in step with the Spirit. We keep in step with the Spirit. Did you guys know I played the tuba in the high school marching band? I'm just full of surprises, aren't I? I was a tuba player for a couple of years, and so my freshman and sophomore year in high school, I was in the marching band. And every marching band has a drum major. And those of us who have been in a band know that it's not up to us to set the rhythm, it's up to us to follow the pace of the drum major. That's what the Holy Spirit is. He leads the church like a marching, like a, like a drum major would lead a marching band. He leads us. We keep in step with the Spirit. He sets the pace, and we do our best to stay in step. Say, Max, that's easier said than done. It sounds kind of mysterious to me. How do you do that? I think the most practical answer to that question that I have ever heard has to do with the list of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. You remember this list? The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. 
So we know that the Holy Spirit is within us when we are showing fruitfulness in these categories. So if on a given day you feel no fruit when it comes to love or joy or peace or patience or kindness or goodness, or you feel none of those fruits, well, guess what? Guess who's out of step with the Spirit? You are. But on the days that you feel this sense of, can we use the word supernatural, inexplicable, illogical, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, well, then you can honestly say, oh, my goodness, that's the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit inside me, and I can be grateful for that. So this week, let the fruits of the Spirit be like indicators on the dashboard of a car. And when you see them, you know that the tank is full. But when you see the needle is on E on any of those fruits, then just turn to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I need more patience. I know it's your desire that I have love. I know it's your will that I have joy. So I turn to you now, Father, and I want to stay in step with you, Holy Spirit. And make it your aim to live a life of unending conversation with the Holy Spirit. Everywhere you go, no matter what you do, at work, at school, at home, make it your aim to live in communion with the Holy Spirit. And then when you feel the nudge or the direction of the Holy Spirit, be quick to obey. Be quick to obey. I'd like to share an example of how the Holy Spirit led me to do something recently. Not at all wanting to leave the impression that I always obey the Holy Spirit because I, I want to do, it, do more so. But on the, oca- the occasion that I did, it was so fulfilling. Some weeks ago, I stepped into a convenience store. Uh, the convenience store I step into quite often uh, to buy a, a cup of coffee and a breakfast taco. I'm a health food fanatic, right? And so uh, I ran into a friend, a friend that that I I see there quite often, just a delightful guy. He always has a joke. He always has a smile, always something nice to say. But that day he had none of those. And I wondered why. Paid for my coffee and my breakfast taco, though I didn't say anything else to him. And as I was stepping back to the car, I sensed the Holy Spirit tell me, turn around and go back and talk to him. Now, you need to know the context. A couple of things were going on. One, this was a few weeks back when all of the news was about immigration, about uh, a federal border policy that was being implemented. And it was everywhere. It was on the radio. It was on television. It was even on the, uh, in the newspaper that day. So it was on my mind. And I don't know how I know this or how I knew this, but I had a strong suspicion that this fellow's wife was undocumented. It seems to me that my wife knew and she told me, but I honestly don't know how I knew. But so all of that kind of came together in the parking lot. I had my coffee, I had my breakfast taco, I was ready to get in the car and go to the office, but then I thought of my friend, the idea of his wife being Uh, undocumented and then all this controversy or this stress about documentation and immigration and so the Holy Spirit what's a good word pressed on me pressed on me to go back in and talk to him Uh, I really didn't want to I didn't know what I would say to him I really wanted to get to work but the Holy Spirit did not ask my opinion it was that strong of an impression and so I put the coffee and the, and the breakfast taco in the car, but I didn't get in the car. I went back in the store, and he was still there. And I found him. I, I, I walked up to him, and he was surprised to see me. And I said, uh, I said I, I, I'm wondering, all this stuff about immigration, are you and your wife okay? And just like that, his eyes filled with tears. Just like that. And he looked to the right and to the left like he was concerned somebody might be listening in. And I said, what's going on? And he said, well, he said, uh, my wife does not have the necessary documentation. He said, but we've been working on it. If I recall, he said for two years, maybe it was just a year, but for a long time, he said, we've been working on it. He said, we got scammed by a lawyer and it exhausted all our savings. 
And now all this is going on, and one of our neighbors told my wife if she ever stepped out of the house, somebody was going to pick her up and take her back across the border. And she is frightened, and she hasn't been out of the house in days. Well, I just happened to know somebody who knew somebody. I, I don't really run in those circles, but I did. I knew, I knew somebody who specialized in that. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah I know why you laughed. No, it wasn't that at all. I, I happen to know uh, an attorney who knew somebody. <laughs> I don't run in the Underground Railroad here. <laughs> no, I happen to know somebody who could legitimately, honestly, legally provide assistance. Good clarification there. A little embarrassed. And so I did. I made a call that day, and I put this friend of mine that I'd seen in the convenience store in touch with this lawyer and this lawyer said I can help with that and the lawyer not only helped with that but helped at a very affordable rate and you know within uh, I guess a week or two weeks the problem was solved it was solved and I thought isn't that is that how the Holy Spirit works is that how the Holy Spirit works you know that that I, I, I didn't ask this friend, have you been praying about this? But I have a feeling he had. I got to believe his wife was. And could it be that the Holy Spirit hears the prayers of honest, God-fearing people and then sees somebody, equips them with the ability to meet that need, brings the two together, and then he has to get behind us and give us that, what was the word? That push, that push. I'm praying this week that all of us can be sensitive to the push of the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Oak Hills just released into the city, into the hill country and beyond? A body of people who indwelt by the Holy Spirit were being used by the Holy Spirit to bring hope, to bring encouragement, to bring answers, to bring solutions. So this week, when you sense that push to forgive somebody, to encourage somebody, to write a letter, to write a check, when you sense that push, may the Lord allow you to be obedient to it. And may you stand on this promise, this great and precious promise, that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of the presence of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. And all the church said, Amen. Amen.